again. So in this video, we are going to be going over several protein extraction and analysis techniques that you will be exposed to in a typical molecular biology or biochemistry lab. So this is just an overview and we'll just kind of talk about various types of techniques that you might be um, looking at or that you might be exposed to. And then as we go into more details with each one, as we go into those techniques specifically, we'll talk about them more in detail in separate videos. So why do we purify protein and how do we purify protein? Protein purification is extremely important in many types of molecular biology um, analyses as well as in biochemistry and chemical analyses of different pathways and different systems um, when we are studying an experimental question. Uh, so it basically means that we are either trying to purify a single type, a specific type of protein of interest from a complex mixture, or a small group of proteins from a complex mixture. Um, and it's usually important, especially in a biochemistry lab, to characterize either the function of that protein, the structure of that protein, and to examine what interactions it has in the larger system. What are the proteins it might bind to, what DNA parts of DNA it might bind to, what RNA it might bind to, any of those systems. In this case, um, just like for normal protein extraction, your starting material can be any biological tissue, can be a microbial culture, can be cells grown in culture, any one of those. So you can use anything as your starting material, any biological material. Um, and like I said, there are going to be many different reasons why we would, might want to purify a particular type or a particular group of proteins. Many times it's to identify the function of your protein, the structure of your protein. It could be to look at binding partners for that protein, which is to say what other proteins it might be interacting with to do the function that it does. It could also be something more than that um, as far as our commercial side is concerned. It could be to maybe um, take that protein, maybe it's an antibody that we're trying to isolate and produce it in large enough amount in order to use it as a commercial product, to sell that antibody. Uh, you could also be purifying it in large quantities um, to have enzymes, right? All those restriction enzymes we use in research in genetics and other places, those are purified from systems like that as well. Um, and within a research setting, it could be to produce a smaller amount of that protein for research purposes to do some kind of analysis with it, any one of the ones that we just talked about. So before we extract, uh, before we purify proteins, we first have to extract all the proteins in the cell many of the times. It's hard to take just one of the protein out specifically right away. Uh, and there are many met methods that we can use for that. And there are many steps to the process to go from that complex mixture of all the proteins in the cell or in the substance that we're taking, whether it's tissue or cultures, uh, cultured uh, cells, and then all the way down to where we have just the one that we want, or purified protein that we are actually caring about. So we're going to usually start out by extracting just the proteins from our cell, trying to take away everything else from there, all the lipids, all the DNA, RNA, all the other stuff that's there, removing that from the system. Once we have those purified proteins, then we can stabilize them in a solution so that we can work with them further and take the ones, take the fractions that we actually care about. Uh, to separate the proteins that we want, uh, maybe we want proteins in a particular pH range, or we want proteins with a particular type of um, biology, maybe the positively charged ones, or we want ones that uh, interact with the lipid membrane, whatever it is, then we would use specific methods. It could be uh, methods related to filtration, if we are looking for a particular size of proteins, or it could be um, chromatography-based methods that several different ones within each category just to precipitate the type of proteins that you want. Once we've separated our fractions, our separated our specific proteins that we think we've got, we then need to check it and make sure that we got what we thought we should have. And so then there are various analytical and verification methods that we can use 
and the downstream go to purify as well as to verify that we got the right thing. To um, the analytical methods like HPLC and mass spectrometry are used to actually also, um, they can be used as verification methods, but uh, sometimes they can be used as part of the purification scheme as well to take just the fraction that we need with the proteins that we want. <coughs> and then for verification purposes, we typically use a combination of gel electrophoresis and some antibody-based methods like Weston's or ELISA's to make sure that we have the proteins that we want. So what can we use to separate our proteins? Well, there are several different properties of proteins that we can use to um, separate the ones that we want, to isolate the ones that we care about. It could be dependent on the solubility of your proteins. So if you're looking at lipid uh, binding proteins, proteins that are part of the membranes maybe, then you're going to use uh, buffers that are going to be more hydrophobic, that are going to be more uh, lipophilic, right? So that you can get those proteins solubilized. Versus if you're looking for cytosolic proteins or cytoplasmic proteins that do not interact with lipids, and then you would use a more aqueous buffer. Um, we could also take into account binding interactions. So for example, if I'm interested in looking at proteins that bind to my favorite protein, I can use the an antibody against my favorite protein to pull down anything that comes with it and see what binds to it. Um, we can use uh, other properties of the surface of the protein, the structure of the protein, maybe how many hydrophobic residues are present on the outside or charged proteins are present, amino acids are present on the outside, and use that to isolate a particular type of fraction that we want. Uh, in addition, we can also isolate the proteins or separate the proteins by their isoelectric point, size, or shape. Isoelectric point is basically the pH at which the net charge of your protein is zero. So I could look at proteins that are going to have uh, you know, that their isoelectric point is at pH of three because I'm interested in proteins that can survive in an acidic environment. Or I can look at the ones that are more in a physiological setting at seven and look at those. And then those proteins are the ones that I would isolate specifically for that particular pH. And then um, for size and shape, we can obviously separate the proteins by size in gel electrophoresis, and then uh, look at just a particular size fraction that we might be interested in. Uh, to extract proteins we uh, from the cells so that we can fractionate them and separate them according to these uh, different properties, we first have to break open the cell, right? So there are different ways that we can do it. It's going to be dependent on the starting material that we're working with. If we are working with materials that are um, very fragile, like cells and culture, um, especially mammalian cells and culture, we can use a more gentle approach because just a little bit of detergent, just a little bit of freeze thaw would be enough to open them up. Just osmotic lysis would be enough to open, break open the cell membrane and let out all the proteins inside. However, if we don't have that, and instead we are working with something that has a cell wall, like a plant material, or we have tissue samples, right, which has a lot of other stuff in it, then we might need more stringent buffers, more stronger detergents. We might need to do further freeze thaw cycles. We might need to do mechanical disruption where we break it apart with um, other methods to make sure that the cell membranes break open and the proteins are able to get out. Uh, so when we do that, there are several problems that we can run into for our extracted proteins. When the proteins are inside a cell in their native environments, um, they are going to be in their own isolated little, little chambers. All the mitochondrial proteins are gonna be inside the mitochondria. All the lysosomal enzymes are gonna be inside the lysosome. All the proteasomal um, you know, degradation enzyme, for example, the proteasomes, uh, will have their own little proteasomal, uh, proteo, uh, proteol, proteolytic enzymes. They're going to be inside those proteasomes. So they're going to be in their own little environment and they're not going to be breaking down other things inside. But now that we've extracted these proteins and they're all in a tube, they're outside their native environment. So everything becomes unstable. 
they can get denatured just because they're not in their normal environment, they're not at their normal pH, they're not in their normal place. They can also get proteolized by these proteos, proteases that are released by the cells themselves. So there are many proteolytic enzymes, these are proteins too. They are in your now lysis buffer with all the other proteins and they're going to go break down other proteins just like they do inside without regards for whether they are part of the cell or not and then obviously because they are now not in their native environment they can get oxidized through the environment as well so there's some things that we can do to prevent these problems from happening and to protect our precious protein extract we can stabilize our proteins partly by performing all our steps at a really cold temperature to lower down that temperature, we are going to prevent these proteases from working at their optimal level, right? They're going to slow down these enzymes and all the modifications that might happen will not happen as well either. We can also add inhibitors for proteases, for phosphatases, and for deglycosylation so that our proteins are protected. Uh, those post-translational modifications on our proteins are protected and they are not removed so that we can still run enzymatic assays. And also, especially if you want to look at a function of a protein, we want to try to move very quickly from isolation to actual activity assay so that we do not lose that activity because of these modifications that are bound to happen over time. So to precipitate our proteins, um, again, it's going to be very important what type of buffer we use, what type of environment we use, and how we uh, make sure to get the proteins in the right way out of the cell. Again, if we are caring about our proteins, just it's, you know, one dimensional amino acid sequence, then I don't need to worry about making sure that the pH is maintained as much or maybe even whether the post-translation modifications are maintained or not. And I can be more stringent with the type of lysis buffer I use, the type of uh, detergent that I use to make sure I get all the protein out. It doesn't matter if it's in a ribbon form, but I have the full protein out and I can look at the amino acid sequence and I can look at those type of studies. But if I'm interested in a protein's function or structure or its uh, interactions, then I need to be careful as to what type of lysis buffer is getting used to solubilize my proteins because I do not want to destroy its function. I want to preserve its structure. I want to preserve its function. <coughs> so typically when we are extracting for the amount of protein, the yield of your protein, we are going to use more stringent buffers, higher as, uh, you know, ionic detergents, um, ionic detergents, uh, higher stringency ionic buffers, uh, so we can use STS and other ionic detergents. They're going to be more harsh. We can use higher ionic strength buffers, but we will, will increase the solubility of proteins and we will get more of them out. But if I want to preserve their function and preserve their interactions, I'm going to use non-ionic detergents. So I do not destroy the charge of my protein. I do not destroy the structure of my protein and I preserve it in a better way. I can also make sure that if I am caring about a particular environment and that's the one that I'm looking at, the proteins that are present in a particular environment, for example, acidic environment in our stomach or a different environment inside our body, that I can extract proteins with specific isoelectric point by making sure that my buffer is in that pH range so that only proteins that are preserved in that pH are maintained. Similarly, let's say, you know, sometimes your protein of interest, there's a lot of it present. You have a bunch of it, you don't need to worry about uh, losing it. But a lot of times, our proteins that we are caring about, our favorite proteins that we're trying to study, are not such a low-hanging fruit. They are actually very specific, they are present in a very small amount in a very specific area of the cell. In that case, I have to enrich for that protein in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes I can do that by fractionating our cells. So if I know that my protein is present in the nucleus, I can isolate just the nuclei, pellet my nuclei, and extract the proteins from the nuclei to concentrate those proteins and just kind of remove all those extra proteins everywhere. 
I can also um, sometimes purify or enrich for those kind of elusive targets by, if I know the molecular weight of my protein, I can say, okay, my protein is a small protein. I don't want all these big proteins to contaminate the mixture and make it harder for me to find it. I'm just going to use a fractionation method to get just 30 uh, kilo delta molecular weight and below proteins. Um, so there are different ways that we can enrich for our proteins through methods like that, by thinking through what it is that I'm looking for and where it is found. And then finally, if I'm interested in looking at what activates my protein, what type of post-translational modifications activate my protein, then I can make sure to add those inhibitors for disrupting those modifications so I can preserve those glycosylations and phosphorylations and acetylations and make sure I'm able to follow them in my treated versus untreated sample or normal versus disease sample, whatever the case may be. <coughs> so, in general, the three big criteria that we're going to be using to purify our proteins are going to be by size, by charge, and by binding affinity. Uh, chromatography is a common method that we can use to separate on any one of these criteria. The type of chromatography is going to be dependent on what criteria we are using. So if you are separating by size, we would be using either dialysis or gel filtration chromatography. If we are separating by charge, we can use ion exchange chromatography. And if we are using by binding affinity, then we are going to be doing what we call affinity chromatography. So let's talk about a little bit of uh, what it exactly happens in any one of these uh, different types of chromatography techniques. The first one is looking at hydrophobic interaction chromatography. This would be the case if I am looking at proteins that are probably present in the membranes, so they are more in the hydrophobic environment. In this case, I will use resins in our columns um, that are amplifiles, so they will bind to those hydrophobic areas. So the hydrophobic parts of the resins are going to uh, attract the hydrophobic amino acid residues that are on the outer part of our proteins, and that's going to bind to those resins uh, strongly, right? Uh, so that's going to form that uh, particular binding. Once they are bound, we wash away everything that didn't get bind, uh, bound to our columns, and then we elute those proteins that were bound by using specific buffers just to elute those, to solubilize those hydrophobic proteins and separate them out. Another thing we can use is uh, to separate our proteins by size. And one of the ways is by doing gel filtration chromatography. There are also many filters available, columns available nowadays at different molecular weight cutoffs that we can use to elute just proteins of a particular size range. So in gel filtration chromatography, again, you're going to have some type of a filter um, or some type of a resin that is going to prevent certain size molecules to be uh, to enter into your column and only others are going to bind. So here you have your exclusion gel. The gel is going to be uh, basically responsible for what molecular weight mo uh, proteins are going to be able to get through. In general, um, you have your smaller molecules are going to enter into the aqueous spaces within the bead, so all this extra space inside it. The larger molecules are not going to be able to get through. And then you can get several different fractions, uh, one with the larger molecules, one with the medium size, one with the smaller size. And you can get them in those initial fractions and then look at the size range that you care about. Um, another thing we can do is, uh, again, looking at that outer surface of the protein, looking at those amino acid residues that are facing the outside, those R groups. You can do an ion exchange chromatography and separate the proteins by charge. Uh, here, it depends on, again, what you want to look at. Are you going to look for your positively charged proteins or are you going to look at your negatively charged proteins? Depending on what it is that you want to separate, you can change the column and what's in there. If you want to separate negatively charged compounds, you would use anion exchange resins, so there would be positively charged compounds in here that are going to bind to the negatively charged compounds. 
but if you want to separate your positively charged molecules, you would instead use cation exchange resins, which would have negatively charged molecules. So your uh, positively charged molecules can bind to that and you can separate them out. Finally, uh, something that we're gonna be using in our biochemistry class as well is affinity chromatography, where you separate proteins by their binding affinity. In this case, uh, the resin molecules inside are going to have some type of a uh, structure attached to them. It could be another protein, it could be another um, molecule that binds to your protein of interest. So in this case, uh, you have glucose binding proteins uh, that are going to attach that we are trying to separate. So our resin beads have glucose residues on them. So because it has the glucose on it, those glucose binding proteins, anything that binds glucose is going to bind to it. And then when we are ready to purify it, we will use an elution buffer to get those proteins off the column and put them into a fraction. And so you are going to get all the proteins that bind to glucose molecules. And that will be your protein fraction that you can then study. So now you don't have all the proteins in the system, you just have those that bind glucose. We could change that up with anything, you know, depending on what it is that we're trying to separate out. We could even use antibodies against a specific protein of interest and use that to separate the proteins as well. Um, this separation technique is obviously based on molecular conformation, so you need to know something about the protein that you are trying to purify so that you can use that to attach those exact ligands to the resin so that you can have these molecules separated. So looking at it a little bit more further, what are the different principles? What are the different steps? Steps for this process? The first one is that we must have some type of a matrix in the column that has the required chemical group that we're gonna use to isolate our fraction. <coughs> Once we have that ligand attached to our chemical, you know, to our matrix within the column, we then add our protein mixture to the column. The protein of interest are all the proteins that might bind, any protein that might bind to that chemical group are going to bind to those resins, to the matrix within the column. All the unbound proteins are just gonna be floating around. We then wash away those unbound proteins with buffer so that on anything that is bound is the only thing that's left. And then finally, we use some kind of high concentration of uh, soluble form of the chemical group to the column so that we can decrease the binding affinity and elute those proteins out and take them into a fraction that we can then work with. So we elute all our proteins into a fraction. This gives us the advantage that we have purified fraction of a very small group of proteins that have the properties that we care about rather than everything else. Um, another way that we can separate our proteins very, very cleanly and uh, examine them is by doing a technique called two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. In a two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, in the first dimension, we separate the proteins by isoelectric focusing. So we usually use a pH range. Uh, you know, this is a gla uh, this is a gel tube which has a pH range, it could be from 3 to 10, it could be 7 to 11. Um, different ranges come through depending on our desires and needs. We separate those proteins by their isoelectric points. Proteins will go to the point where the net charge is zero. They'll move until at that point and then stop. And then we take this uh, focused uh, isoelectric uh, focused gel tube we treat all the proteins, we put it in a buffer with SDS, so all the proteins are now going to be negatively charged at the point where they are. We place them on top of a second polyacrylamide gel that can separate these proteins by size. And then in the second dimension, we separate the proteins by their molecular weight. So in this case, we have the proteins separated by their PI in one direction and by their molecular weight in the second. So you have a unique fingerprint of each of your sample that comes out as a result. Each one of these spots will only have a couple of proteins at most. It won't have a lot of proteins at any given point. And those specific spots can be excised 
um, digested and then examined through mass spectrometry or HPLC to examine exactly what protein is there identified. So the analytical techniques we use in this case are high performance liquid chromatography, HPLC, or mass spectrometry. In either one of these cases, we take our sample of that purified protein that we've gotten, we inject it into the uh, detector, and it's going to look at the chromatogram that we get out of it, either to show you different how many different proteins are present, or even in a tandem mass spec, it will give you the amino acid sequence so that you can actually identify those proteins of interest that are present in that sample. Um, once we have our samples, we can verify them through many different techniques. The three techniques that we are going to be uh, looking at that are most commonly used are STS page, Western blotting, and ELISA. So let's talk about what it is. STS page is essentially um, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. STS is a ionic detergent that makes everything negatively charged in the system and also kind of denatures your proteins. So in this case, we um, purify our proteins, we get our protein extracts, we uh, add the STS containing loading dye to it, we heat that up so all the proteins are essentially in their primary structure. We add our samples into this uh, matrix made with polyacrylamide, which is your polyacrylamide gel, um, and we run that using an electric current. It separates the proteins by size, and so we can look at the pattern of these bands uh, within our different samples and look for differences within them. Um, however, if there's a very specific protein that I'm interested in, I would want to go one step further and run what we call a Western analysis. So once we have separated our proteins, we then transfer them onto a, uh, either a nitrocellular or a cellulose or PVDF membrane so that they can be more protected we then use antibodies against the protein of interest that we care about, uh, amplify our signal with a secondary antibody with some kind of a detection substrate, and then visualize it uh, using our um, different systems that are available. And at that point, the only thing that is going to light up will be your protein of interest. And you can examine its relative amount between the various samples, its presence or absence within the sample, any other one of those things. Uh, this technique can be taken a step further by looking for binding partners in a special technique called co-immunoprecipitation, where you take your affinity chromatography and your Western blood technique and combine them together to get more information about your sample. So let's say that I'm interested in some protein that, uh, let's say I'm interested in Kreb or Galactin-3, and I want to know what other proteins it binds to after I stimulate the cells or after I put them in a given situation. Well, I can create a, um, either I can create a construct of my own if I don't have an antibody against my protein of interest. I don't need that. So <coughs> I can flag my protein of interest or put a tag on it to use to immunoprecipitate it. Or I can use the antibody against that protein of interest. So once I have my protein extracts, I purify them in a very gentle manner after I cross-link all those interactions and I then use an antibody against the protein of my interest. So if I'm looking at collectin-3, I can use an antibody in my affinity chromatography against collectin-3, bind collectin-3 to it and anything else that's bound to collectin-3 because I've already cross-linked those interactions. And then I can um, elute that fraction off. I will then run them on a Western blot. So I will run them on an STS page gel, just like we did before. So all the proteins that came along with collectin-3 will also be separated by the molecular weight. And then I can examine what came out. I can look at various, uh, the patterns. I can isolate them. I can um, examine them by mass spec and try to uh, identify them that way. Or if I have an inkling as to some of those things that could be bound to it, maybe I think integrin is bound to it or another protein is bound to it, then I can use those antibodies and see if those fall down along with it. 
Another assay that we use, again, to quantify the amount of proteins in our different samples, uh, again, using an antibody approach, is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. In this case, our purified samples are not separated by any gelolecophoresis or anything. They're taken directly into a pre-coded 9612 plate with our capture antibodies already placed on them. Uh, this is going to allow our samples to bind to that. We then use an antibody, a detection antibody, against our protein of interest so that it can uh, bind to that as well. This type of ELISA is called a sandwich ELISA. We then use a um, detection antibody as our third component within it to amplify the signal and to cause a color change that we can then examine to quantify our um, protein of interest in our various samples against a standard curve. So in our class, we are going to be using a bunch of these techniques as well to go over uh, the course of semester to examine the presence or absence of our specific proteins of interest. Uh, we're going to purify them and we're going to quantify them using ELISAs as well. So we'll talk more about these as we go to each technique specifically.